This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello there and welcome to Global Business Africa. We'll be giving you insight into Africa's business and financial markets. I'm Uchiyo Koronkwa, coming to you from Kenya's capital, Nairobi. Let's start with a look at the markets. Now, risk aversion ruled markets today as a surge in worldwide coronavirus cases left stocks facing their longest losing streak. Emerging market stocks tumbled as investors rushed to safe havens, dragging MSCI's Emerging Market Stock Index about 1.3% lower today. Also, losses in heavyweight Chinese tech stocks did weigh on the index as fears of stricter regulations in the country's tech space certainly rattled investors. Alibaba and Tencent, two of the top three stocks on the MSCI index, fell about 3% and 2.5% respectively. Now, in South Africa, the all share slipped over 2% with all major indices down. The resource 10 was down almost 4% on the day, while the financial 15 slipped over 2%. Now also coming up on today's show. Widespread looting in South Africa cripples post-COVID-19 economic re recovery efforts. Oil prices slump after OPEC's, OPEC plus, plus leaders deal on production. And Johnson & Johnson explores plans to place its TALC liabilities on bankruptcy protection. Well, we begin tonight's program in South Africa, where violent protests have dealt a body blow to the government's efforts to rebuild the economy in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, protests began last week after former President Jacob Zuma handed himself into police to serve a 15-month sentence for contempt of court. Economists now expect the looting and rioting that have since laid waste to swaths of KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng to curtail economic growth in South Africa this year. Now, the unrest, however, is not likely to spark a rate cut this week when the Central Bank's Monetary Policy Committee meets. In a new policy brief, the Institute for Economic Justice has also called on the government to roll out a short-term $5 billion emergency relief package over the next three months. The IEJ's latest proposal was prepared prior to the outbreak of the ongoing unrest and aims to cushion the economic effects of level 4 COVID-19 restrictions. Well, let's find out more from Busi Sibeko, a researcher at the Institute for Economic Justice. Great to have you on the show uh, with us today. Now, of course, the IEJ uh, believes that uh, these short-term relief funds will not only help cushion uh, South African citizens from the effects of COVID-19, but of course also deal with the consequences of the recent unrest. So factoring in recent events, how exactly do you suggest the government rolls out uh, these funds? Yes, um, and thank you for having me here. Um, we believe that, you know, the package that we've put forward um, takes into account the existing infrastructure that our government has to implement um, a rescue package. So what we've been arguing over the last year is to say that we are not over the crisis. And in fact, even before um, the violent protests that you see now, people were really in destitute, right? Businesses, households, and workers were in a very precarious position. And in fact, we really needed government um, to roll out further emergency rescue measures. Most of these measures have actually ended, um, you know, the ones that were announced last year. And so what we've been arguing is that the current context, and in fact, we've been saying that we are headed for a humanitarian crisis. And I think we've been in a humanitarian crisis, and this moment shows that um, more than ever, that we need emergency rescue measures now even more, you know, and we've always needed them, um, but in this current context, I need it. Mm. Now, as you mentioned, past programs have finished, but the government uh, uh, only spent about 4% of GDP on emergency uh, relief programs before. Can South Africa's government afford to allocate uh, the 7 billion rand, or rather 70 billion rand, uh, that you're calling for immediately for emergency relief in the country? Absolutely. I mean, last year, the government actually announced a 10% of GDP rescue package. 
our assessment is that only 4% of the 10% of the right, the 4% has actually been implemented and utilized. And that's, of course, not factoring in issues of misspend, um, issues of people not getting their money fast enough, issues of exclusion and so forth. But we've argued that, you know, even if you look at it in terms of what was announced, there's certainly still room um, in the amounts that were announced to expand the measures. But also as an institute, we've been working a lot to propose alternative ways of financing over and over again. We've called for a resource range tax, um, which would be implemented when commodity prices are favorable. Um, we've argued for wealth tax, um, you know, and, and many other measures in which the government can finance this. But we do believe that given what was announced, that it can still be made available. And if more is needed, in fact, that there are many other economic policy tools that can be used um, to raise these funds. I think the ultimate question is, what is the cost of not implementing the rescue measure? And as we can see currently, the costs of not acting are actually way higher than if government had done the right thing and implemented further rescue and emergency measures. Mm. Well, looking at the data, only 41% of the original uh, 500 billion around COVID-19 relief package was used. So. In light of that, what is your assessment of the effectiveness of the previous rescue measures and certainly how that could impact the rolling out of a new package uh, if the government does do, do that? Yes, so um, the previous package is quite complicated in a sense that it was a, a package of many smokes and mirrors. And just to give you an example, one fifth of the announced package, um, for example, only 12.6% of that was actually allocated in the budget. And the rest of the money was planned to be used in the you know medium term. So in fact, that announcement in itself and how it was actually implemented was way below the expectation. And so it wasn't necessarily a failure of government to finance it, but it was actually government falling short um, in actually making the budget provisioning for that amount of money. The other amounts, you know, we're looking at, you know, two thirds of about half of it was really for business rescue and it was through a loan guarantee scheme, which has had very low uptake. And the reason why the low uptake is there is because it had stringent rules and criteria around, you know, qualification for it. But also not only that, but we understand that businesses are in crisis and they're not really looking to, to get more debt. Um, right, because we don't know when COVID is going to end and so forth. So the failure of that particular facility was really the stringent rules, um, but also the inaccessibility for many businesses, but also it not being viable for many businesses to accumulate more debt. Um, and so this goes really to, I think these two examples are really showing that the, in the inefficiency of the package itself wasn't necessarily the design, but in fact, it was the implementation of it. Um, and so the numbers themselves, as much as we would have argued that a larger package is needed, um, you know, or significant package in certain areas is needed, was not necessarily the, you know, the, the, the amounts themselves. So government is capable of implementing it. It's also about improving, you know, some of the efficiency. So when we look at the allocations for health, for example, um, we do know that there were large um, issues with expenditure, misspend, especially at the municipality level. Um, so those are some of the issues that need to be tackled around efficiency, especially when it comes to, comes to budget allocation, how are municipalities and departments actually spending the money is something that we have to deal with. But of course, we've got, you know, the UIF, which is an unemployment insurance fund, and that is implemented through a very different facility. And so some, some of these, you know, initiatives themselves, it's a mixed bag of effectiveness, depending on how you look at it. But it was quite efficient um, in the ways it just wasn't large enough, nor was it, you know, implemented correctly. Mm. Well, we do have to leave it there, Busi, but many thanks for your insights there. That, of course, is Busi Sibeko. She's a researcher at the Institute for Economic Justice. Well, let's move on now to Tunisia. The country has secured about $70 million in funding from the African Development Bank to implement its economic recovery and social support program. Now, Tunisia is facing economic challenges further compounded by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. It has turned to international lenders to back its battered economy and its vaccination campaign. Well, from Tunis, here is Adnan Shaushi with the details.
Tunisia's pandemic battered economy has received a shot in the arm after an approval of a credit facility by the African Development Bank. The announcement follows the meeting in May between Tunisian President Qais Saied and the AFDB president, who pledged support for the North African state during its post-COVID-19 recovery. The AFDB president also noted that Tunisia needs to implement several structural reforms in order to achieve inclusive growth. For this year, the African Development Bank will strongly support Tunisia with a $270 million funding. $70 million will be dedicated to the positive support of the Tunisian state. We discussed the importance of inclusive growth and job creation for youths during this period. Tunisian Social Affairs Minister has welcomed the funding and said it will support the economic recovery process by improving the investment climate, preserving employment and promoting social inclusion through new mechanisms to address social challenges exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. This funding will allow us to support the sectors and the economic activities most affected by the pandemic and the lockdown measures since May 2021. The successive general lockdowns have paralyzed many businesses and caused unprecedented layoffs. Authorities in Tunis added that the objective of the program is to improve the efficiency of social spending by streamlining social assistance programs and adopting a more targeted approach to beneficiary populations. Even the citizens who do not have social security will benefit from this financial support. We are aware that tens of thousands of people lost their source of income and were unable to find new jobs. The crisis is affecting all social classes and categories. The funding from the Abidjan-based Lanta will also support 230,000 employees threatened by layoffs and who are exposed to technical unemployment to preserve their jobs or provide them with social assistance. 1.4 million microcredit applicants will also be able to access banking services thanks to the program. According to the African Development Bank, mitigating the socio-economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and supporting a more sustainable and inclusive economic recovery are the AFDB's priorities to help Tunisia emerge from the current economic and social crisis. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. And heading to Tanzania now, the country recorded eight year, an eight-year high coffee exports in the recently ended nine-month season. And that's thanks to COVID-19 lockdowns, which helped a spike, which spiked coffee drinking rates in the country. Now, the season saw Tanzania make around $137 million from coffee exports, a 20% increase from the previous season. Here's CGTN's Isaac Lucando with more from Dar es Salaam. Godfrey Mzava has years of experience exporting grain. However, logistical challenges due to COVID-19 lockdowns around the world unexpectedly shifted his attention to coffee, earning him an income in difficult times. When the COVID-19 pandemic began, we were very surprised to get orders to export coffee. We didn't do much last year given the fact that we were only starting off. We got an order from Vietnam and one from China. This year, we already have three orders lined up. Tanzania has traditionally exported its coffee to Japan and Europe. Authorities are now keen on capitalizing on China's growing interest in Tanzanian produce. Many traders, they prefer to trade in China as a, it's quick or, and also easy to trade with China compared to Europe market. So we think uh, there was that big demand compared to our capacity of producing yeah, last year. And also we expect uh, this year it will be the same because we receive a lot of inquiries from China market. While exports are booming, only 5 to 7 percent of Tanzanian coffee is consumed locally. The government's stated goal is to boost these numbers to at least 10% by 2025. According to the Tanzania Coffee Board, coffee represents about 5% of Tanzania's total exports, earning the country an average of $100 million every year over the last 30 years. 
With a growing demand for the country's coffee, authorities are worried about the lack of information dampening the enthusiasm of potential exporters. They are hoping the recent launch of a trade portal will help garner more interest from traders. Most traders, they think that it's very complicated to acquire export documents, some of them, and that's why we are basically uh, putting effort on creating awareness on export procedures and, and requirement documents for export. The government wants to exceed its current output of 70,000 tons of coffee annually. It hopes to offer farmers, traders, and thousands of their dependents in the country more income and better lives. Isaac Lukando, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. Now look at our corporate headlines today. South Africa's Standard Bank has announced plans to take full control of financial service firm Liberty Holdings. Now, Africa's largest bank by assets already owns about 54% of Liberty Holdings, but it wants to purchase the remaining 96 million shares at a price of $729 million. Now the deal that will see Liberty delisting from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and subsumed into, into the lender. And staying in South Africa, Toyota has raised concerns with local authorities regarding the impact of the unrest and looting in KwaZulu-Natal on its operations and, of course, investments in the province. The unrest has also impacted Toyota's manufacturing operations at its plant in Durban. The Japanese car maker suspended production there last week. Exports from the plant have also been halted. And Rwandese authorities have approved Kenyan lender KCB Group's deal to buy Bank Populaire du Rwanda from London-listed financial services firm Atlas Mara. Now, KCB Group announced in November it had signed a deal with Atlas Mara to buy 62.06% stakes in BPR. The acquisition is part of the group's ongoing strategy to explore opportunities for new growth and achieve regional relevance. And finally, Britain's GlaxoSmithKline has laid out plans to set up a new life science campus within its R&D site in Stevenage, England. The London-listed drug maker hopes to create up to 5,000 jobs in the next 5 to 10 years with the addition of the new campus. Now, GSK expects to select a developer from the private sector later this year and it will begin work on the project backed by the UK government in 2022. And that's a look at our corporate headlines. Well, we are heading into a short break now, still coming up on the show. Oil prices slump after OPEC Plus leaders deal on production. And Egypt's e-commerce platform, Max AB, secures $40 million in funding to aid in its expansion. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global business. Only on CGTN. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just a table mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference.
Welcome back. Now, oil prices have dropped after the organization of the petroleum exporting countries agreed to boost oil supply from August in order to cool uh, prices. The move has sparked some concerns about a crude surplus as COVID-19 infections arise in many countries. Brent crude was down about $2.54 or 3.4 percent at $71.05 a barrel. And we also saw U.S. oil down 3.6 percent at around 69. $17 a barrel. Both benchmarks recorded their largest declines since early April. Now, the group of members of OPEC and allies such as Russia also agreed new production shares from May 2022. Well, let's get the latest on that meeting from Elena Cassis, and she joins us now in London. Uh, good to see you, Elena. Now, there's certainly been an internal battle simmering amongst OPEC and its allies. Uh, give us a sense of what this deal reveals about uh, the current state of OPEC Plus and certainly the strength of that alliance. Well, the deal gives a number of OPEC Plus countries, not just the UAE, who originally objected and caused the stalk talks to stall, of course, but also Saudi Arabia, Russia, Kuwait and Iraq, a green light to pump more oil. Now, that's how most analysts thought that this would be resolved. If the UAE asked for more, other countries would also want their quotas raised. So it has avoided the breakdown in the pact that could have been possible here and indeed extended the agreement on output until the end of 2022. The energy ministers of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, the two countries who are principally at odds, of course, say they are happy with this deal. So worries about countries going it alone, pumping more oil and trying to undercut each other seem to be off the table for now. Mm. Well, they seem happy, certainly seem happy with the deal, but... Uh, was there a clear resolution to those long-standing grievances uh, amongst the group, such as, of course, disagreements about the way the quota uh, has been calculated? Well, the energy ministers refused to answer any questions about how the compromise had been reached at their press conference yesterday. As you say, the central disagreement was about the baseline production quota from which these cuts are then calculated. And a number of OPEC plus countries have seen that revised under this new deal. Nigeria and Algeria may also see their quotas revised. So those immediate grievances have been resolved. But OPEC plus, of course, is not a particularly transparent organisation, although lots of their talks often do leak uh, so we don't really know how they arrived at this mm. now of course the agreement is to boost output by about 400,000 barrels a day each month uh, from August uh, some analysts are calling that a bit moderate what does this mean for the oil market uh, where we're seeing demand significantly higher and of course supply still remaining tight Well, as you said earlier, what's hit the oil market today on the back of this agreement is the opposite concern, the worry that surging coronavirus cases in much of the world, particularly in Europe and in Asia, are going to push demand down once more and that this supply increase, moderate as it is, will turn out to be too much. Brent crude has lost more than 5% today. So currently the OPEC deal keeps about 5.8 million barrels of oil a day out of the global market. That will now fall by 2 million barrels by the end of the year. And the intention of this deal is to deflate the price in the short term, but it doesn't mean that that's the effect that it will have in a few months' time. It's worth pointing out that analysts at Goldman Sachs said today they do still see an upside for the price. So they're still predicting Brent crude will reach $80 a barrel this summer. And that's because OPEC Plus does still maintain a fairly tight physical market and its ability to control the price has increased during the pandemic after oil production fell in the U.S. Mm. Well, we'll certainly watch uh, the way the price goes. Thank you so much, Elena, for that update. That's Elena Cassis joining us there in London. And moving on now, Chinese State Council and Foreign Minister Wang Yi is heading to Algeria. That's after concluding a three-day trip to Egypt. Wang met with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi and Egyptian Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri. Now, his talks focused on boosting cooperation between Egypt and China in all fields. Here's Adel el Mahoui with more. Wang Yi concluded a three-day visit to Egypt's new Alamein city on Monday. There, he met with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi to discuss developing ties between the two nations. This year, 
Egypt and China are celebrating the 65th anniversary of the establishment of their diplomatic ties. I appreciate the comprehensive strategic partnership between us, which participated in providing qualitative transformation and a leap between us in all fields, especially during the past seven years. We look forward to more support from China, our friendly nation, to Egypt's stance in the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam, based on the existing strategic relations and the importance of the issue of Egypt's existence to reach a fair solution for all involved parties. Egypt expressed its desire to open more opportunities to export agricultural products to China and increase Chinese foreign direct investments in Egypt. The talks tackled how both countries can help in establishing stability in the Middle East and counter terrorism. In that regard, Wang announced that Egypt will be a dialogue partner in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a body concerned with battling extremism. We see Egypt as the most significant, comprehensive, strategic partner in the Arab world, the Islamic world, African and developing nations. We are very keen to develop our relations with Egypt. Our ties have yielded fruitful results, especially during COVID-19 pandemic. We've provided support in a spirit of one team which formed a model for developing nations. Our cooperation in this field is a new significant step in our ties. Wang Yi and Egyptian Foreign Minister Semah Shukri signed an agreement to establish a government cooperation committee to lead the development in relations both nations seek. The Chinese Foreign Minister's final meeting in New Alamein was with the Secretary General of the Arab League, Ahmed Abu Ghait. They discussed cooperation in regional conflicts, on top of which the Palestinian crisis. Wang Yi's visit solidifies the comprehensive strategic partnership between the two countries. Hosting it here in this Mediterranean city is yet another indication that Egypt is keen to include China in its mega national projects that would help in boosting its economy. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, New Alamein, Egypt. Meanwhile, Egyptian e-commerce platform Max AB has secured $40 million in funding to help it expand across the country and the broader Middle East and North African region. Now, the platform, which manages procurement and grocery deliveries, is helping suppliers to tap into technology in order to boost their supply chains. Here's CGTN's Yasser Hakim with more on their story from Cairo. Max Saab is continuing his success story with a new $40 million Series A funding. The three-year-old startup is filling a vacuum in the food and grocery retail sector by cutting the six-layer supply chain for thousands of small retail stores countrywide. Suppliers also benefit from the startup's end-to-end -end business intelligence tools that allow suppliers to accurately predict, monitor and control the impact of their strategies in real time. We're an end-to-end -end distribution B2B e-commerce platform. What we provide and the value proposition of the company today is that we have 24-hour delivery. Meanwhile, we contribute to around 35% of the shelf space of the retailer. So it's the one-stop shop for that retailer, making his business easier to implement. Maxab made headlines in 2019 when it broke the record for the highest seed for a startup in the Middle East and North Africa. With $6.5 million, just a year after it was set up. We visited the facility back then and discussed the potential of the service. It's a $50 billion market, right? So 10% of that market is $5 billion. So when you see a good team and at the right time solving a huge, huge problem, it's one of the single biggest items on the GDP uh, of Egypt is groceries. It's around 16 to 17% alone. Since 2019, the company's value grew five-fold year-on-year. Its assets jumped from three warehouses in Cairo to 17 warehouses in seven cities and has provided 1,600 jobs. This helped secure the latest $40 million series round. The main reason for this fund is for us to expand in the MENA region. Uh, we still don't know exactly where we're going. We have a few countries that we've pinpointed. It depends on the value proposition as well as the market product fit. But we see three to two countries that uh, might be of great benefit for us to move there. Maxab's success reflects the growth of the startup sector in the North African country. According to Magnet Startup Annual 2020 report, 
Egypt is the most active venture capital market in the Middle East and North Africa and the second most funded after the United Arab Emirates. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Now, tourism industry players in Kenya are optimistic about a rebound following the arrival of more than 300,000 international visitors in the first half of this year. The sector suffered a devastating slump because of COVID-19. The latest statistics from Kenya's Tourism Research Institute show that East Africa's biggest economy received just over 300,000 international arrivals in the period between January and June. This is, however, 262,213 shy of the total arrivals recorded in full year 2020. Now, during the six months reviewed by the state agency, the U.S. was Kenya's top source market, followed by Uganda and Tanzania. The fall in numbers pushed hoteliers and airlines into losses estimated at billions of shillings as they scaled down operations for months due to a lack of traffic. It also hurt the earnings of the state-run Kenya Airports Authority, which of course runs the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport and other airfields in the country. Kenya suspended international flights in March 2020 after reporting the first case of COVID-19. And moving on now, the security crisis in the Sahel region has resulted in a drop in demand for sheep as traders eye the upcoming Islamic festival of Eid al-Adha. The Tabaski celebrations, as it is popularly known in, in West Africa, is scheduled for Tuesday. However, the lack of animals in markets spread out across the region has affected the anticipated celebrations and, of course, the sales. Here's CGTN's Wilkista Nyabwa with more on that story. Traders located in the Sahel region are reeling from lack of demand for sheep amid the upcoming Islamic festival of Eid al-Adha. They had earlier forecasted a huge turnaround in demand. However, the unprecedented jihadist conflict, ethnic attacks and banditry have affected their sales. The Minister of Rural Development and myself have indeed taken steps to involve the Ministry of Defense, the Minister of Interior and the Minister of Internal Security and all the governors of the regions concerned so that the animals can really come in suitable conditions. And in the vast areas outside of state control, Islamist militants often levy taxes in the form of livestock. Recurring droughts in the semi-arid region also decimate herds. Dealers who make it to markets in Sahelian cities now often bring fewer animals with them, driving up costs for consumers. Yes, we have had difficulties. The difficulties are that it takes a lot of effort to reach their destination. With insecurity, we can no longer use our own loading points. The ship have to walk for miles to reach the secure points. In 2012, an Islamist insurgency was launched in northern Mali. The crisis has since spread to the center of the country, as well as neighboring Burkina Faso and Niger. According to the UN Refugee Agency, thousands of people have been killed and over two million have been displaced. The dire situation has left herders with no freedom of mobility. Even in areas that are major providers of livestock, there are no longer any free-range sheep. What you see here are animals from domestic fattening. In addition to lack of pasture, there is also the security situation maintained by the Fulani which means that people no longer dare to venture into the bush to look for animals. We came to Niame to sell the few sheep we were able to get after combing the bush because there are not enough sheep in the countryside because of the insecurity. This shortage of livestock is caused by the security problems that the country is experiencing. And we pray to God to put an end to these troubles so that business can resume. As a result of high prices linked to insecurity and climate change, customers also struggle to find sacrificial sheep for Eid. Sheep that once cost $63 now cost $150. The armed groups attack the herders frequently, so they are forced to move. They are afraid. They don't want to come even with their animals. Just 48 hours ago, a truck was attacked 15 kilometers from Duenza. 
The government has since launched a sales promotion aimed at securing at least one animal for every Malian to slaughter. But across the Sahel, once bustling livestock markets have been muted this year. Wilkisanyabwa Sijitian. You're watching Global Business Africa. Let's take a short break now, but still coming up on the show. Johnson & Johnson explores plans to place its talc liabilities on bankruptcy protection. And massive losses projected for Japan at the forthcoming Olympic Games. This has taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time, it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. Woo! It's really exciting. <laughs> Business in Africa is at the crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges, from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. And here's a recap of today's top headlines. A Chinese State Council and a Foreign Minister, Wang Yi, is heading to Algeria after concluding a three-day trip to Egypt. Wang met with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi and Egyptian Foreign Minister Sami Shukri. His talks focused on boosting cooperation between Egypt and China in all fields. And Tunisia says it is facing its worst health crisis since the outbreak of COVID-19. The World Health Organization has expressed concern about an increase in coronavirus cases as countries across the region prepare to mark the Muslim Eid al-Adha holiday on Tuesday. The Tunisian government has banned intercity travel to prevent social gatherings where infections could spread. And Ethiopia has announced that the second round filling of its Grand Renaissance Dam has begun successfully, or rather has been success, successfully completed. The Water, Irrigation and, and Energy Minister Saleshi Bekele said the dam now has enough water and will soon begin the first phase of 740 megawatts of ele electric power generation. And that's a recap of today's top headlines. And now to some international news. Johnson & Johnson is exploring an arrangement that could see it offload multi-million dollar liabilities from widespread lawsuits over claims that its baby powder product contained a cancer-causing 
asbestos. According to the reports, the healthcare giant could transfer the litigation into a newly created business that will then seek a bankruptcy protection. Now, Reuters reports that J&J &J has not made a final decision on the option and could abandon the idea. The company has faced legal action from tens of thousands of plaintiffs claiming its iconic baby powder and talc-based products contained asbestos, causing ovarian cancer and mes mesothelioma, uh, which is a type of cancer that most commonly affects the lining of the lungs. Meanwhile, the Tokyo Olympics without uh, spectators is, is expected to cause astronomic losses for Japan. Global data says that losses from ticket sales will amount to roughly $800 million. Now, ticket sales were expected to be the third most important source of revenue and set to fund 12% of the overall budget. Lack of fans is also expected to make brands reconsider the value of their hyper-costly in-arena sponsorship. Official data shows that local businesses had agreed to sponsorships of about $3.3 billion. Some might still opt for a refund as the value of in-arena sponsorship has been severely reduced due to the absence of audiences. On the other hand, global broadcasters say the Tokyo Olympics could be its most profitable ever, and that's thanks to a large stay-at-home audience. And elsewhere, England has lifted almost all of its COVID-19 restrictions. Nightclubs and large performance venues have reopened, while the recommendation to work from home has now ended. However, Prime Minister Boris Johnson's Freedom Day ending over a year of COVID-19 lockdown restrictions in England was marred on Monday by surging infections. For more on this, here's our correspondent Andrew Wilson in Oxford. This is stage four of a long complex what the government called roadmap uh, for releasing restrictions after a year and a half of some extraordinary changes to people's lifestyle so from now on there's no more legal limits in england on social contact no more restrictions on indoor or outdoor gatherings no rule of six at home all the venues can reopen no legal requirement for social distancing no uh, measures such as table service in in bars there's no legal requirement for masks to be worn on public transport or in shops so that's all fine the problem is as it happens at the moment and we can talk about this in a bit both the chancellor uh, rishi sunak and the prime minister boris johnson are currently uh, self-isolating because they've been spotted by the nhs test and trace app as being in contact with someone who was infected who happens to have been the health secretary sajid javid so that's put a cloud over proceedings but also there are throughout the country deep concerns about the timing of all this the delta variant is still very very strong uh, in the uk although the vaccination program is helping that to an extent but the, the the final conclusion amongst the government and it has to be said a lot of the scientists was we do need to lift these measures at some point so if not now when will we do it they don't want to do it any closer to winter because then there'll be influenza and flu epidemics as well to worry about and it could make matters even worse so the uk is taking the plunge but this self-isolation program, which is the app that everyone carries in their phone, is wreaking havoc at the moment, it has to be said, on the workforce. Anyone who gets into close proximity with an app on the telephone who is infected and class is infected will ping the other person's app. And so we have now, through that and other isolation measures from traveling and so on, up to a million people in the workforce who are currently in self-isolation uh, but most of them are actually healthy and that's causing problems in the transport sector the restaurant sector hospitality sector and so on and that's making the public nervous so the polling suggests that by and large the uh, the british public are not hugely enthusiastic about freedom day one half of the public almost certainly will take to the beaches go to the nightclubs go out to restaurants go back to large gatherings like football matches and so on but the other half are likely to stay at home and carry on wearing masks and keeping themselves out of harm's way because they're still not convinced that everything that's being done has been done. Meanwhile, China's top economic planner says that strong momentum in the services sector helped fuel the country's economic recovery during the first half of this year. Now, the National Development and Reform Commission approved about 40 new fixed asset investment projects during the first six months, primarily in fields such as transport, energy and information technology. China's across-border rail networks helped maintain the trade momentum and offset the pandemic effect on the shipping industry to a large extent. 
Over 7,000 China-Europe freight train trips were made in the first six months of this year, and that's up about 43% year on year. Now, from digital wallets to the rise of QR codes, there's little doubt that contactless tech has transformed our lives in recent years, perhaps, perhaps especially during the global pandemic. But where does this rising technology go next? Well, as Jim Stenman finds out, the answer might lie in the tips of our fingers. An abundance of colors and eye-catching patterns. Having a manicure can be quite therapeutic for some, while others might see it as a form of self-expression. Now this may look like just another beauty salon, but it's so much more than that. Clients here are able to place a chip on their nail. The technology was introduced as a way to support social distancing, but it has significant potential, especially in a post-pandemic world. Actually, after the corona situation, uh, we have to encourage also the paperless. So uh, we came up with this idea and it's really doing well. The technology behind the treatment is called Near Field Communication or NFC, allowing digital devices and chips to communicate over short distances, which has already helped make Apple Pay, used by millions around the world, the success it is today. While Lenore is the first UAE-based nail salon to experiment with the technology, essentially using it as a digital business card. When the client she comes to us, we just ask her which information you want to install in this chip. Then uh, nail technicians, they install this chip on her nail and cover it by any nail polish. It's a gimmick, as we say right now, so it's the, the fun and the joys of trying something new. And while chip nails are likely to remain niche, at least for now, interest in contactless sharing of data is on the rise, especially in the aviation industry. Both airports and airlines in the industry have been significantly minimizing their expenses, but at the same time increasing the investments very specifically in contactless technologies. This, this type of technology will have quite some surprises for us in the years to come. And while that may be the case, scientists at Carnegie Mellon University have recently managed to embed NFC technology into the surfaces of everyday objects, which could offer a glimpse into a future where this type of smart technology is simply part of our daily lives. Jim Stenman, CGTN, Dubai. And tonight on What's Hot, as we mark the 200-day countdown to the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics, organizers are busy putting the final touches on venues and other Olympic infrastructure. Meanwhile, Chinese athletes are taking advantage of innovations in technology and training facilities in order to boost their performance. Here's CGTN's Zhang Yibing with more. Modern technology is having a profound effect on winter sports, none more so than the bobsleigh. Well, this is a bobsleigh designed by Chinese companies from the automobile and aerospace industries. So let's have a try. The new bobsleigh will be released in September. Its raw pal will be there for all to see at the Winter Olympics next February. Through all the technological innovations, elite athletes in these speed winter sports don't necessarily need the real thing anymore to train. What we see now is the skeleton simulation. On this platform, we can also simulate sledge, cross-country skiing and slalom. Various physical training facilities are in place. Ultimately, the training facilities look similar to those in the gym, but when I touch the button and get started, I feel it very difficult to handle and control. This platform simulates various athletic fields like uphill, downhill, sideline, and some obstacles. Large facilities like these will help winter sports athletes improve their performance. Besides training and monitoring, athletes need to think of their long-term condition. Physical recovery is a necessity for winter sports. Equipment like this is something we have never seen before.
This device helps professional athletes relax after training. It's called a sleep cabin with a water flow-like experience. But upcoming Winter Games in Beijing, measures for epidemic prevention and control are key. These are just some examples. When crowds gather, the system can avoid cross-infection. It guarantees the national team's preparation in the holding of the upcoming Winter Games. With the Winter Games coming closer, more news on the venues, facilities and equipment will be announced. And of course, we'll keep being amazed by these new developments and innovations in winter sports. Zheng Yibing, CGTN, Beijing. And before we take a short break now, here's a quick roundup of commodities today. Oil prices falling sharply. Brent slipped over 3% and that's after OPEC Plus overcame inter internal divisions and agreed to boost output, sparking concerns about a crude surplus as COVID-19 infections rise in many countries. Meanwhile, gold prices slipping to a one-week low as investors sought comfort in the U.S. dollar. That's amid those rising coronavirus cases. And taking a short break now, here's a look at what's still to come. Innovation revamps agriculture in Nigeria. Now, agriculture is being transformed in Nigeria and is rapidly changing as more innovations uh, help people to farm and earn money. One young Nigerian agro-entrepreneur has introduced an initiative to make farming easier with as little as a simple click on the phone. Here's CGTN's Deji Badmus with a story. Abisola Debayo is browsing through the various crops on display on the Africa Wealth Initiative application. She's looking for a farm and a crop to invest in and make good returns on her investment. She's literally trying to farm from her phone and from the comfort of her office. The innovation is the brainchild of computer science graduate turned farmer, Rebecca Mao, who together with her team developed the app which allows people to virtually invest in agriculture and get their profits without doing the hard work. It's called Farm From Your Phone or Start Small, Grow Big App. The day to day um, activity of a farmer without technology is tedious. As you can see, some of the works we are doing. And that's why we brought her, uh, that, that's what brought about the Farm From Your Phone program so that people who cannot go through all of this stress can earn even from their homes. Why we are on, the, I'm on ground to do this work and also improve this process, improve the system so that everyone will be interested in agriculture. The starting point of the Farm From Your Phone program is simple. You go onto the app, you subscribe on the, on the app on a particular crop before cultivation. So you choose the one that is convenient for you and the time that you know you can be able to wait for your money to generate income and you invest in it. When you invest in it, we take that money from the investor, we uh, plunge it into the agri system, whether from farmers, um, smallholder farmers or in our own farms. We develop the crop during the process of development of that crop. Each investor gets to see the progress of the crop as the crop is progressing. Then by the time the crop is harvested, we take it to the farm, we sell. Profits are now shared between investor, farmer and the platform. Amo and her team began the program at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic last year to enable people earn from their homes. The app now has close to 10,000 subscribers and investors. About 50 young people have been engaged to work on the farms of the organization. And Farm From Your Phone has been able to change your orientation of many youth because it, it educates you about the process and make sure that you can participate in food production without being on the farm. And our EAP program, which is the Entrepreneurship Affiliate Program, has also empowered youth they can also earn from the product, food production 
without being on the farm, by educating others and by empowering so many people. And in the long run, farmers are empowered, which increases food production. It brings about improved system. It creates a lot of close to farm processing hub for farm clusters. Amao and her team are hoping to expand the program and are seeking more funding to do so. They believe their initiative can go a long way in helping the country attain food self-sufficiency. Digibatmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. Now a doctor in Kenya has developed what could be the first reusable nano mask. It is arguably Africa's first mask and is made for real-time deactivation of infectious agents. Here's CGTN's Nick Wudimba with a story. Talk about an invention at the right time, at the right season. This is a nano mask that protects you from bacterial infection, viral, and of course, fungal. It's an invention that has come in handy during this tough COVID-19 time and invented by none other than Dr. Nderito, who, of course, I want him to tell us more about the inspiration of coming up with this. Doc, good to see you. Thank How are you, you doing? Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm Dr. Joseph Nderito, and uh, I'm a human anatomist. I'm a medical doctor, and I'm a nanotechnology researcher. And I'm um, the one who came up with the Tiro Nano Mask, um, which is the culmination of many years of work and interest in nanotechnology. Uh, in my primary interest was the development of uh, products to reduce the problems of antimicrobial resistance in Africa. And so when COVID-19 struck, and I knew that uh, I had uh, technology at the back of my mind that could help deal with the, the problems that we were we were facing so I thought that it would be a good uh, a good thing to see whether the a nano mask uh, a mask with the capacity to kill virus to kill bacteria and viruses and all that could be a better tool to deal with the issues of of uh, the pandemic uh, than what we had and uh, from a lab point of view it was clear that this is actually working as predicted, but I needed it verified by, by, by uh, um, uh, microbiological tests, right? And so when we tested the, the material in the, I submitted the material to the National Microbiology Reference Laboratory, which is like the topmost level of microbiology test you can have. Uh, a reference laboratory is the top laboratory in any, in any system. And then we introduce the, the fabric into the into that food we call it culture media, and see whether the, the bacteria will be killed by the nanoparticles that diffuses into the media. So basically, that's what we did, and we actually we got very very good results. And uh, these are fabrics that can be used in maybe hospital setup like um, the lab coats. You know the lab coats doctors, nurses, and lab technologists, scientists like me use. Uh, they can be used to make such codes. So you say, uh, what if the, there's a decay rate is 0.1%, 0.9%, 0.2%, and that is the reason why I have limited its wash cycle to 100 uh, washes. So the mask uh, would put the production cost for each mask at uh, $5 a piece, which, uh, which is, it, is uh, the, from research and development, all the chemicals involved, uh, the, the, the entire operation that is before going to the factory. And then there is the amount that is the hours charged by the factory itself for the production process, including the stitching. So that would be about $5 a piece. So this fabric that apparently looks normal to people, it's, it's the one that we're saying it's impregnated with the nanoparticles. The term impregnation is important here because in science, that means it's, it's not just coating, it's, uh, it's forcing the atoms to become permanently bonded with the chemical structure of the material. Dr. Narito now hopes to capitalize on the welcome move by Kenya's microbiology lab approval to come up with more inventions that would improve the quality of life. Nick Mudimba, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Well, that's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. Remember, you can send your feedback to the contacts on your screen. You can also follow us on our various digital media platforms. From me, Uche Okoronkwa, and the rest of the team, thanks for watching.